I'm speaking on principle-centered leadership. Principle-centered leadership. There's a verse of scripture that means a lot to me and which is what we use to dismiss our services in Daystar Christian Center. It's Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. And um, although I know the house is full of pastors, I would still like to read it. And I'd like for all of us to read it together, if we can. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. It says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then, you will have good success. So Lord, we ask in Jesus' name for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Lord, we know that you seek to use your church as the lighthouse, as the place of reference. We know that you promised us that in the last days the mountain of the Lord's house will be exalted above every other mountain or hill and that men will flow into it saying that they want to learn from the God of Jacob and to follow your ways. So we ask that you help us to be rightly positioned for what you want to do in our days. In Jesus' name. Amen. A principle is a rule or a law that has to be followed. A rule or law that has to be followed. The basic definition of a law is a universal fact, something that holds true on every spot on planet Earth, especially for a law of nature. A principle can also be an inevitable consequence of something, and we find that especially in the laws of nature. So when you deal with a principle, you're dealing with a situation in which if something is absent, you can never get the result that you desire. So some principles are simply fundamental law or doctrine. You can also have for a group or society a code of conduct, and that becomes the basic principles that govern the operations of the group. It can be for a family, it can be for an organization, it can be for a nation. And then the third category is the one I've been referring to, a law of fact of nature. And most times, those laws underlie the working of mechanical devices. Uh, There's electricity. There's light here because of electricity. My voice is being amplified right now because of electricity and other laws. Your car moves because of the laws of motion or the laws of dynamics. And, And aeroplane can fly in the sky because of the laws of aerodynamics. Anyone who believes in the God of the Bible must value principles because the God of the Bible created 
principles. Principles are powerful. Some of the things we know about principles is the fact that they don't change. Principles don't change. Methods change, but principles don't change. If you want to build anything that will be sustainable or durable, you know, therefore, that the best foundations on which you build them is on principles. In Matthew 7, if you read from verse 24, Jesus said, Anyone who hears these sayings of mine and who does them, I will show you what he's like. It's like a wise man who wanted to build his house, dug very deep, found a rock, built on the rock. Then he said that the weather elements came and beat vehemently on that house, but it stood. He was describing his sayings as a rock. That's principles for you. When you build on principles, you're building on solid rock. Because principles never change. Principles make success possible. And they make success predictable. Principles make success possible. Because bounded uh, within the context of each principle is power, especially when you deal with the principles of nature or the laws of nature. There's tremendous energy, tremendous power in our universe. But what God did was to put the different forms of energy and power within the context of principles. You satisfy the conditions of a principle, the power held by that principle is released to aid you to achieve your goals. You break the conditions of a principle. The power within the principle works against you. So principles make success possible. I hold in my hand um, an orange seed. For the orange seed to turn into an orange tree, that's a miracle. That's a miracle. But there's a principle there sowing and reaping. There's power within it. Under the right conditions, I put the seed in the soil. Invisible power enters the seed and evolves something that never existed before. It has the capacity to produce fruits and seeds. It's a principle. It's a law. I can't create it. God created it. It's, it's just the way it is. But when I understand the conditions and satisfy them, then the power within the principle is released to aid me to achieve my goals of getting an orange tree or getting orange trees and fruits. So principles make success possible. But notice also that I added that they make success predictable. I plant a maize seed now it is predictable that except there's some interference somewhere in 90 days, I will harvest maize. Predictable. I jump from a five-story building, from the balcony of a five-story building in Lagos. The result is predictable. I don't need a profit. Absolutely predictable. I'm coming down. <laughs> Under the anointing of gravity. <laughs> I'm coming down. And if you feel that it's the work of witches, it's the work of the enemies, then I suggest you go to London and jump from the balcony of a five-story building. You will come down. And it's likely you may conclude the witches followed you there. <laughs> I would suggest you go down to Sydney in Australia. Go to a very far place. Jump from a five-story building, you will come down. The result is predictable. I want to live my life that way. See? It creates insecurity when your results are not predictable. It creates frustration. So principles make success predictable. They make success possible, and they make success predictable. 
One good thing about principles is the fact that they do not discriminate. Principles have no respect for persons. They have no respect for status. They have no respect for color. I like that because it means then that principles provide a fair play field or playground for everyone. Like I say humorously sometimes, if you put the president of the United States on one hand on the roof of a 10-story building, you put the president of Nigeria next to him, and then maybe you find a poor man, a poor beggar from somewhere, and he stands next to them. And you ask the three of them to jump. The law of gravity will not look at them and say, what? The president of the United States of America? Please, hold him up there. Don't let him come down. That, 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 that will have global consequences. The president of Nigeria, let him come down, but let him come down slowly. <laughs> the beggar, it's of no use to anybody. Let him come. the three of them will come down at the same rate. A poor man plants corn, it will grow. A rich man plants corn, it will grow. That's powerful. Anyone who feels that he or she is weak and who desires to rise or to produce results needs to take advantage of principles because that's the one place where you experience fairness. then I should add that principles give leverage. Principles give leverage. They help you to achieve big results with small effort. In the science class, I was taught uh, about machines, about levers, and how you can use effort to pick loads. And depending on how you position the lever, uh, you can use big effort to carry a small load. But then you can also use some small effort to pick a big load. And they say it depends on what you call mechanical advantage. That's why we need machines. That's why we need technology. Principles give, therefore, leverage. I have one seed. I want five bags or I have seeds in my hand, I want 10 bags, or 20 bags, or 50 bags of maize, uh, I can leverage on the laws of sowing and reaping to multiply what I have in my hand. Anyone who is wise must value principles because they give you leverage, especially when you are a leader. Leading yourself is enough work. But for you to have to lead people, 100, 500, 1,000, move 1 million people in the same direction, <laughs> if you had to go talk to each of them, you're in trouble. So you have to find points of leverage. You know, I, I love the story of Zacchaeus in the Bible. Smart man. Because at the introduction of his story, what we hear about are his disadvantages. He wanted to see Jesus. First, they said there was a crowd. Two, they said he was short of stature. <laughs> Disadvantages. But the man quickly thought, the reason why I can't get close to Jesus now is because there's a crowd. This crowd didn't come today. They started with him from yesterday. If I'm going to see Jesus, then I have to create my own tomorrow today. Today was created yesterday. So he runs. He starts running. <laughs> okay? And then, too, he climbs a tree. That's leverage. Since he was short, he had to find something that was tall <laughs> to stand on. But you see how God honored, you know, whatever it was he did. Because when Jesus got there, he stopped. Jesus saw him, everything changed from there. 
So principles give us leverage. And then the knowledge of principles creates paradigm shifts, and this is very critical. The knowledge of principles create paradigm shifts. When uh, builders construct roads, sometimes when they hit a rock, they decide to blast through the rock, but some other times, they just take the road and, and go around the rock. There are some things in life you can't change. Principles are in that class. You can't change them. They have the power to change you. Sometimes when people say that they break rules or they break a law, ultimately the reality is that you cannot break a law, especially God's law or a law of nature. Ultimately, it is that law that will break you. When you are wise, therefore, and you come across a principle and you are going to clash or conflict with the principle, you are the one who shifts your thinking. So you can align with the principle. So rather than have the principle work against you, then you have the principle work for you. You know, there's this uh, well-known story about uh, the ship, you know, uh, the ship captain who was moving on the water, and then he saw light in the distance. And believing that it was another ship, he sounded out a warning to the captain of that ship that he was approaching and told that captain to change course. And the person replied, I will advise you, rather, to change your course. This captain repeated the instructions. I am (laughs) so-and-so. He described the ship. I think it's in your best interest that you should change course. The man on the other side replied, I'm advising you that it is, it is in your best interest that you change course. Then the man, on the first captain, you know, said, I am so and so. This is the status of this ship. For the last time, I'm advising you, change course. The other man replied, I'm the lighthouse. (laughs) Or I'm the man in charge of the lighthouse. The lighthouse is a building. It's not a ship. It's a building (laughs) in the middle of the water (laughs) from where they're able to scan the water. Lighthouse can't move. That was the end of the discussion. I'm the lighthouse. When you come across a principle, that's what works. You are the one that shifts. Amen. (laughs) It doesn't matter what your sentiments are. It doesn't matter what you believe. So, principles create for us paradigm. They help us to experience paradigm shifts. They shift our thinking in many ways. And principles fuel creativity. They fuel creativity. Uh, They help us to innovate, help us to invent The parts of the world that do not value principles are unable to create anything because they can't leverage on the power that God has invested in nature to accomplish their goals. The degree to which individuals, families, organizations, and even nations align with principles determines the degree to which they succeed. The degree to which individuals, families, organizations, and nations align with principles determines the degree to which they succeed. When God, especially on the long term, so when God brought Israel out of Egypt, it was one of the major things that he had to do get them to align with his principles. Because when God created his principles, he subordinated himself to his principles. Very important. He's exalted his word above his name. 
That's why he is predictable. He created the principles. He is not limited by them. He has sovereignty. He can choose to suspend them. Okay, to accomplish his goals. But that is a rare occurrence. So, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, the first three verses, Moses explains to Israel, the reason why God allowed you to go through this terrible wilderness, allowed you to hunger and to thirst, is this. He wants to test you to know what is in your heart, whether you will do his commandments or not. And that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, by the material, the physical alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Listen, for former slaves who had experienced so much deprivation of material things, former slaves who had experienced poverty, material things had tremendous value for them. And they had a lot of insecurity. So when there wasn't food to eat, they were insecure. Okay? And Moses said, the reason why God allowed you to go through and he would come and intervene, he would allow you to experience a problem, intervene and solve it, is so you will realize, as far as God is concerned, solving your problems is a small deal. You can take that as a given. But he's trying to do something. He wants to shift your value system to the point where you value intangible things over tangible things because principles are intangible. So, when you have cultures that have evolved from a history of slavery or colonization, one of the unfortunate legacies of slavery and colonization is the overvaluing of material things and the definition of success and wealth mainly by the material. Because generations after generations have suffered deprivation, they define success as having money, as having a big house and having a big car. And God had to create that shift while they were still in the desert. So Moses said, that's the reason why God allowed you to go through all the things you went through. So that you will realize man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Psalm 1 verse 3 says, blessed, uh, Psalm 1 verse 1 says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law does he meditate day and night. Verse 3, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Principles make success possible. And predictable. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 1. You know, that, that's a passage of scripture. You know, verses 1 to 13. We love them, right? But it wasn't, Moses wasn't speaking to an individual. He was speaking to a whole nation. If you will hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord your God and obey his commandments, which I command you today, he said, the Lord will set you on high above all the nations of the high. So you see that? Nations rise to the degree to which they are aligned with principles. It doesn't matter what the history is. Alignment with principles is critical. It's the same for an organization. It works for a family. Let's talk about the principle of vision, for example. Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, people perish. What you see inside today is what you will see on the outside tomorrow. Without a dream, you are sunk. It doesn't matter. For an individual, it applies. For a family, it applies. An organization, same. A nation, same. If a nation has no clear vision, clear picture of what it's going to look like in the future, it will perish. It's a principle. It's a law. Okay. So the degree to which individuals, organizations, families, nations align with principles determines the degree to which they succeed. So God was trying to get Israel to value principles. And for us who have grown up in parts of the world 
where we have experienced slavery or experienced colonization before, this is very, very critical that we develop a value for principles because there are cultures that are built on unverifiable myths and assumptions. Very interesting. The proverbs, the adages, the belief system is built on the belief that the world is an unpredictable place that is controlled by invisible and invisible forces. Invisible and overwhelming forces that you cannot control. There's no need to plan. You see, I said success makes pre- uh, principles make success predictable. Because they are principles and they don't change, you can plan. You can plan the next 30 years. Am I right? <laughs> 50 years ago, when they planted maize, it grew. In 50 years' time, if the world has not disappeared, when they plant maize, it will grow. Because principles don't change. So with that, you can plan. But when you live your life, in a way that you do not recognize principles or you don't believe in them. There's no point planning. There's no point planning. So, while they were discovering the laws of dynamics in some parts of the world, in some other parts of the world, the emphasis, you know, was on mysterious transportation. In my language, Egbe, that's what we call it. Just disappear. And they appear somewhere else. You see, where it's... The interesting thing about Christianity and about God is that he encompasses all the lines of thought. There's a part of him that is predictable built on principle. There's a part of him that is not predictable because it's not even all principles that are known. But the way he created our world, he created it to be run on principles. So when you become a Christian, it does not automatically mean that you will become principle-centered or you will have value for principle. The tendency is that we lean to the part of Christianity that aligns with our culture. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul the Apostle was explaining it. He said, the Jews seek for a sign. The Greeks seek for wisdom. Okay? The Jews seek for a sign. So you have that part of the world that is not built on logic. See, the Greeks seek for wisdom. They believe in logic. You have to be able to understand it. Okay? They discover the principles faster. But then you have the part of the world that believes in miracles. Neither is wrong. Okay? Neither is wrong. The only problem is that the part that believes mainly in logic finds it difficult to have faith. We find it difficult to believe that things can happen outside of the scope of those principles that they've discovered. But God is sovereign. I tell people, it's one thing for you to know the principles. You need to know the principal who created the principles. But then you have the part of the world that believes in science, miracles. And I think our part of the world aligns with that. The big problem is that we have the tendency to miss out on a part of God that is vital. And that's the part that values or recognizes principles. So when you listen to our stories, you hear our myths. Um, we believe that things just happen. So when we carry that over into Christianity, it influences our prayer points. At the point at which God is expecting us to just simply align with the principle and to get results, we divert it to prayer. Since, you see, <laughs> principles make you to accept responsibility that a miracle is a product of the combination of divinity and humanity. To harvest maize, 
I have to sow means. It doesn't matter how much prayer I can pray. I will have to go. I will have to clear the ground. I will have to sow the seed. You know, so that gives man. Man doesn't like that part. That dimension, that approach. The best part, the most suitable part for us is the part where God does everything. That's why it's very easy for you to hear around here, God will do it. God will do it. A lot of the time when we say God will do it, God says, I have nothing to do with it. You will do it. (laughs) Okay? God expects leaders to be examples of obedience to principles. As leaders, we have that responsibility. You know what I love about how Paul the Apostle concluded 1 Corinthians 1? He said, But to us who are called, Christ has been made to us both the wisdom of God and the power of God. Both dimensions are in Christ. Amen. Both dimensions are in Christ. The logic part is there that values principles. The power side is there. Amen. That can suspend principles temporarily to achieve God's purposes. Jesus disappeared sometimes to appear somewhere else. Philip did it. We call it Philip's ticket. Disappeared. <laughs> from Samaria and showed up in the desert, or disappeared from the desert and showed up elsewhere, okay, in Azotus. But if that was the way God designed for human beings to move around on this earth, that would, Jesus would not have needed to walk from Jericho to Jerusalem or walk from anywhere. Every single time, Jesus would have disappeared from somewhere and appeared somewhere else. So that's why, though we hear the stories of it, that that it is possible that there's some kind of charm that some people made, you know, in the environment, and they could disappear from here and appear there, that's why it was not sustainable. That's why before they brought cars, then our forefathers should have, if that was standard principle by which we should live, then it should have been written down. The process and procedure should have been written down. Before they brought their railway stations and airports, we would have built our egg base stations. Right? Both dimensions exist in Christ. So, but our focus in this conference is on leadership. And we're talking about principle centered leadership. And I want us to appreciate how critical it is for us, especially in our part of the world, to model value for principles. Very critical to allow God to work. Listen, if I plant an orange seed and it grows into a tree that is bearing orange fruits, it's a miracle. I can't do it. The tomorrow man can't do it. There are many things man has been able to do. He's not been able to invent a seed. A seed is life. It's the creation of life itself. So, There's, there are miracles in nature that the planet that you are standing on is suspended in space and not held by anything. It's a miracle. You know, it's the principle of gravity that is holding it and rolling it around the sun. So, we can't say because we're spiritual, we will not value principles. In fact, our spirituality is the reason why we should value principles because we understand the power of the intangible world and the fact that it is the invisible world that created and sustains this visible world. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 20, I'm going to pick a number of passages from Matthew very quickly. And with that, I will make my point. First, Matthew 5, 17 to 20. Hear what Jesus said. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. 
I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So I'm not a lawless person. 18, for assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the Lord till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's my point. When you value principles, you value order. When you're a leader, your group, maybe your family, maybe an organization, maybe a church, maybe a business, maybe a whole nation. When you're a leader, you know that principles will give you leverage. Am I right? The extent to which you and the people you are leading will succeed will depend on the degree to which you align with principles. As a leader, therefore, there's a huge responsibility on you to align your life first with principles. Because we're talking about the exemplary leader. So the leader needs to model value for principles and people need to see the power of principles work in the life of the leader. Because the more that happens, the more people align with principles, the more order you have, the more the group succeeds. So Jesus says here, because they were getting a bit confused about him because he was breaking quite a number of their rules. But you will see eventually The part of their rules that he broke were the ones that were man-made. He said, I didn't come to break the law or the prophets. I came to fulfill them. But I'll tell you what the problem is with the leadership that I met on ground. They teach men so. They don't do it. And Jesus said, in God's scheme of things, anyone who teaches people principles but doesn't do them will be the least. It takes you down. Listen And we're speaking now as leaders in church and Christians who are leaders in the world. We're talking about the influence of the church in the society. When you have a church, when the body of Christ does not align with principles, does not value principles, it discredits God's testimony. When there's a gap between what we teach and what we do, we describe that gap as hypocrisy. I said that yesterday. Hypocrisy erodes the credibility of a leader. People find it difficult to trust you. And then they take a cue from you that everybody is supposed to do some acting. You say what you are supposed to say, but you do something else. So, Jesus had big issues with hypocritical leadership. Big issues. Matthew chapter 9, for example, verses 11 to 13. I said I'll just pick a few of those passages and my point will be made. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus had that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The kind of leadership that Jesus met on ground, being a leader put you in an elite class, and there were people you couldn't afford to associate with. And these were spiritual leaders, These were God's representatives. They were people they didn't want to associate with. When they saw Jesus, therefore, eating with tax collectors, extortioners, corrupt people. Because sometimes when you read tax collectors, you may not understand what it's all about. You know, what was the problem with tax collectors? They were the most corrupt people in the days of Christ. Extortioners. (laughs) They could make your life miserable because if you didn't pay tax, they could jail you. So they increased the amounts of tax, remitted some to government and kept the rest. They're very corrupt. 
those were the people Jesus was hanging around. The Pharisees couldn't take it. Because they were meant to be the spiritual leaders. The guardians of God. Protectors of God. <laughs> Uncles and aunties of God. Okay? Who couldn't afford to see God embarrassed? Or disrespected? And Jesus, when I was hanging around, would cast, when you see sinners, prostitutes, that's a fine word, you know, to describe commercial sex workers. Those were the people Jesus was actually, they couldn't take it, they couldn't understand it. So they went to the disciples of Jesus, <laughs> your boss is supposed to be a man of God. How come he's associating with people like that? And Jesus had and pointed out to them where the problem was. They didn't understand anymore the focus of leadership. What's the focus of leadership? People. It's people. Leadership is about people. And in fact, the purpose of power, the purpose of wealth is to create equality. Remember Isaiah 40, verses 29, 30. He gives power to the faint, to them that have no might, he increases strength. Anywhere leadership is done well, the resources, collective resources are taken and they are distributed in such a way that the weak don't lack. You remember Acts chapter 2? After, as soon as Christ ascended and the power of the Holy Spirit came and they had the day of Pentecost, the first thing the church did was to ensure nobody went to bed hungry. Nobody went to bed hungry. People who had land sold them. They understood the essence of the gospel. They understood the essence of leadership in God's house. So they took from those who had excess and redistributed in such a way that those that had none had some. When you see any society that is not principle-centered, you will see its effect on the lives of the most vulnerable people. They are abandoned. They are on their own. Nothing to sustain the person who doesn't have a job or the one who doesn't have parents. Nothing for them. Jesus took that. The Pharisees had forgotten that. The leaders who were supposed to represent God and who were supposed to create equality were the ones that created inequality. Special class. We need to be careful. When being a minister puts you in a special class that nobody else can, can come close to, we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. Amen. But maybe if we put a comma after this, touched. Because we have some high priests now that cannot be touched. So it's when you move close to them that you'll be able to touch them, isn't it? You can't even move close. Because there are bouncers. So, <laughs> when you see pastor <laughs> with someone carrying gun close to him, wisdom should tell you that you should know your limits. Hallelujah. Matthew 12, from verse 1, just a few more passages and I'll stop. Matthew 12, from verse 1, just to sensitize us to the responsibility heaven is putting on us. As a pastor, I am conscious of the fact that the people who hear me teach in church are the ones that will be local government chairmen, will be senators, Amen. governors, Amen. CEOs of multinational corporations, Amen. and pastors of churches and heads of ministries. Amen. And I realize that more than what I say, how I lead is what they will copy. So if I don't value people, if the focus is not on people, <laughs> it's interesting. Jesus said to his disciples, the Son of Man came not to be served. But we evolved from a leadership culture where the leader is served. Being a leader makes you entitled to be served. That was the kind of a culture Jesus grew up in. And he said, no. I, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to do what? To serve. To the point of giving his life as a ransom to many. We can't afford to expend all the resources on ourselves. What right do, will we have to hold the local government chairman to accountability? Or to be accountable? Matthew chapter 12, Jesus picked on something else. 
At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain to eat. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. (laughs) And then he went on to explain to them, Look, do you understand the purpose of the Sabbath? Man was not made for Sabbath. Sabbath was made for man. The way God designed man, even though he made him in his own image, man is not God. When he has worked six days, he needs to rest on the seventh. Amen? Amen. It's for the sake of man, but not to the extent that man will have a problem and you will now solve it. Because it is Sabbath day. Jesus said, some of you have sheep. If your sheep falls into a well on Sabbath day, you will bring sheep out. Human beings have problems. You don't want to do anything about it. You are using Sabbath as excuse to put people in bondage. The purpose of leadership is service. It's solving problems for people. But now you are hoarding the service. You know what Jesus did there in Matthew 12? He went straight into the synagogue. Sabbath day. He saw a man there who had a withered hand. He said, stand up. He looked around. It was the, Jesus was confronting the system. The leadership system and culture that he met on ground. That had become useless to the common man only empowered the rich few. He said, Mister, stretch out that hand. Jesus healed him. The Pharisees were very angry. Listen, not unbelievers, spiritual leaders. I believe God that a new generation and a new kind, new class of leaders will be produced and that they will come from God's house. People who will have compassion for the weak in the name of Jesus Christ. You know the challenge that we have in our environment? The way the average person suffered deprivation is the way pastor also suffered. The suffering in this part of the world knows no discrimination. And long before you had any call, poverty dealt with many of us. So as pastor is praying and believing God, (laughs) you know I've told my story before, how I was praying and I said, Lord, the Bible says the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Bring people. So you are the one that hurts people. Why are you not bringing people? Bring people. Let the church grow. And he asked me a question. Why do you want the church to grow? And I kept quiet. Because I know that God knows everything. So by the time <laughs> he's asking you a question, there must be something there. <laughs> and sometimes he just wants to confront you with your stupidity. And I sensed I was on that channel. You understand? So I kept saying, he said, I know why you want the church to grow. You want to be more comfortable. He said, you want to be more comfortable. You know that the bigger the church is, the more comfortable you will be. He said, I want the church to grow quite all right. But that's not why I want the church to grow. He said, I didn't set up that church to make you comfortable. I set it up because of those people that I sent to you. He said, until you help them to succeed, you will not find the definition of success for your ministry. That was a turning point for me, leadership-wise. Because then I could take the focus and fix it on people. Sometimes we don't realize how much havoc we create when as leaders in church we allow our desperation to show through. Or sometimes we don't even want it. It shines through anyway. The way we raise offerings sometimes the church members know what is motivating it. Five offerings in one service. They know. And I'm telling you, they have our strategies. They have strategies for us. I won't allow this pastor to kill me. How much is the money? You now want to collect everything. You say, I should dip my right hand in my pocket, dip my left hand in my pocket. I will decide what will be in the pocket before I come to the service. (laughs) You, you, You know the proverb, if a child knows how to die, the adult too knows how to bury it. Or, if all I want to give is 500 naira, I will change it into 100 naira notes. Five times. You say, dance, dance, I will dance. Dance, 5,000 naira dance. But all you will get, pastor, 500. It's fixed, determined. Let me close from Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Being leaders in church puts tremendous responsibility on us to ensure that we live out the principles of God's word first, especially in an environment like ours. Matthew 
Matthew 23, from verse 1. There, there is a whole lot more that I could talk about. <laughs> a whole lot. Because, for example, I remember the scenario in Matthew 15, where Jesus was addressing the kind of teachings that the Pharisees were doing. And Jesus detected the motivation behind those teachings. And that's the sensitive part. That's why I want to stop with it. Um, Permit me to go back to chapter 15 and pick out what Jesus was talking about there. And I'll be done in a few minutes. Matthew 15 from verse 1. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. We are spoiling the ministry. Spoiling ministry business for us. Verse 3. He answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? God commanded saying, Honor your father and your mother. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. Koban. Verse 6. Then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus, you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites. Isaiah already spoke about you. You draw near with your mouth, but your heart is far from me. Listen. What were they doing there? Unethical leaders usually change the rules to feed their greed. So it's just a matter of time before it begins to creep into the teachings. Then you begin to get revelations. What God said was clear. Honor your father and your mother. Then they introduced some very, and I'm sure when they taught it, Even people said, preach it, pastor, preach, rev, that's rev. You see, even though God said, honor your father and your mother, however, when you separate that money and you decide to sow it as a seed to God for your lifting, it is Koban. It has become a gift to God. Listen, just tell your parents. Even though I was preparing to give you, I've sown it to God in such a way that by the time the harvest comes, it will come for you, for me, and it will come for you. Everybody will agree. Jesus said, I see through. I see through your motives. You are diverting funds to your pocket with revelation. Only God knows how many revs are flowing through pulpits right now to corner money to direct the flow of funds into the pockets of men of God because everybody has to take care of himself. We live in an environment where there's so much poverty, so much deprivation that everybody expects when you have your own opportunity, your own platform, use it. You are now the local government chairman. And then you left office. And you know the unpredictability of occupying political office in Africa. They can remove you at short notice. In fact, it's on the radio that you will hear that you have been removed. <laughs> While you are on a course to <laughs> Dubai or somewhere, they will call you from home that they have announced on the radio that your time has expired. So then everybody tries, therefore, to take care of themselves before. So, okay, so by the time you are done, you, you were local government chairman for four years or for five years, and then you say you don't have a house. In the kind of an environment that we have, people will blame you for not taking care of yourself. So, so even as pastor, people understand. That's your own platform. Anybody who works at the altar should be there. And then we help it with reds. So, uh, chapter 23, practically the whole of Matthew 23 is about this. Okay? But I'll pick just a few instances. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes, that's from verse 1, and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works. 
For they say, and they do not do. They bind heavy bodies, hard to bear, lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places that face the best seats in the synagogues. Greetings in the marketplaces and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you do not be called Rabbi. All these titles, hide them. For one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be what? Your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then he spoke to the Pharisees, woe to you, you are hypocrites. You shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You don't go in, you won't allow other people to go in. You devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers. The key there is in verse 3. They say they do not do. God expects us to bridge the gap between knowledge and action. So that's why he said to Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate in it day and night. That you may do what? Observe to teach it. To do it. That you may observe to do it. He said, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. But you know, verses 7 and verses 9 are also instructive. Be strong and very courage, because it takes courage, sir. It takes courage to live by principles. It takes courage to do God's word. It takes courage. And it takes faith, absolute trust in God. The fact that everybody is doing it doesn't make it right. And today, we have a nation, we have a generation that is looking up to the church to live up to its reputation as the pillar and ground of truth. God's standard, God's candle set on a hill to throw light to the community. You and I have serious responsibilities, heavy responsibilities. The primary work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian, once you are born again, is to help you build your character. And we have to take that back to where it belongs. We told people, the proof you are blessed is God will bless you with a car. He will prosper you. Fine. But unfortunately, we also have fraudsters who ride fine cars. Where is the difference supposed to come in? Satan does not have the capacity for character because the foundation for Christian character is love, which is the greatest commandment. Jesus said, love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Anyone who says he loves God but does not love his fellow brother is a liar. You can't love God without loving man. Amen. Amen. So leadership in church must be loving. The proof of love, forgiving and giving. Forgiving and giving. So when we look at God's standards, we realize none of us is perfect. We've made mistakes before. But you know what I love about the God of the Bible? He's a God of mercy and grace. When the Bible writes the stories of powerful men who walked with God. What do we see there? They had weaknesses. Abraham had issues. Jacob had issues. They had weaknesses. David had issues. You would think that if God expected us to be perfect in character, why would he allow their mistakes to be written in his book? So we will know there is hope for us. He expects us to grow towards perfection, but he knows who we are. And he expects us to depend on him for grace to help. 
it is not a crime for a leader to have a witness. It's a crime for a leader to be hypocritical about his or her weaknesses. Second Corinthians 12, Paul the Apostle explains, with all the revelations that I got, I discovered I had an issue. He said, concerning this thing, I besought the Lord thrice. You know what God said? No, because this weakness or this whatever problem or challenge it was that he had, some people said he had bad eyes, and that was why he had other people write his letters on his behalf. Whatever it was, it didn't fit the picture of success for someone with that kind of anointing. Uh-uh. He said, three times I asked God. What did God say? My grace is sufficient for you. He said, for my strength is made perfect where? In weakness. When Paul got the revelation, he said, therefore, I will glory in my infirmities so that the power of Christ may rest on me. You know what's going to make the difference in our own leadership and the leadership of those that God helps us to raise? It will be in the fact that our accomplishments are products of the power of the Holy Spirit and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Did I hear you say amen? Amen. They won't be products of schemes. They won't be products of gimmicks. They won't be Ishmael's. The product of sophisticated ideas that help God out of a corner when he is boxed and he can't give us the financial breakthrough he promised. No. God wants to use Isaac, not Ishmael. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you and I will enjoy God's help. Where we have made mistakes, what does God expect? He that covers his sins shall not prosper. But he that confesses and forsakes them shall obtain mercy. If there is anyone who needs to pray in this world, it's the minister, the man of God, the woman of God, because of the responsibility we carry. Because we're not permitted to teach people what we're not doing. I'm not supposed to be teaching people to give when I don't give. Greed is running my life. I'm teaching people give. You know what will run over them? The spirit of greed. They too will be looking for ways to scratch hair, scratch their lie, change the figures, change the invoice in their office so that they may have to give. It's heavy responsibility. Not by might, but not by power. But by my spirit, says the Lord. You know the prayer I pray most? Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, help me. There are crazy things I will have done, I'm telling you. Many crazy things that I will have done, but for God. Thank God for the grace of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. It's real. And if anyone here made a mistake, I believe this is the Mount of Restoration. If anyone is overtaken in a fault, he said, you that are spiritual, Galatians 6, 1, restore. So we shouldn't kill our wounded. Rather, we should let them enjoy God's mercy and then fresh grace through us. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that if there is any way in which Satan has exploited weaknesses in our lives, today is a day of forgiveness, a day of restoration, and I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, someone here will enjoy open heavens. This will be the place where human ability comes to an end. Human ability to get funds, Human ability to find someone to marry. Human ability to succeed in ministry. I pray in the name of Jesus that the days of insecurity, the days of fear about the future, about what will happen, about provision, I pray that those days are finished. I pray that today will be a day of fresh baptisms. By the power of the Holy Spirit. New levels of spiritual authority. And I pray in Jesus' name. That today is a day of restoration of opportunities. The opportunities that were misused before, heaven will restore them. Opportunities that were lost, heaven will restore them. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, today the cycle of failure is broken. I pray in Jesus' name that because we're putting our trust in God, the visions God gave us, will be fulfilled. Dreams will resurrect. 
in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we've gotten all some questions and we've tried to just sort. We may not be able to go through everyone's question, but we'll try as much as possible. Okay. The first question I have, sir. Someone says, um, how is he going to influence his colleagues at work um, who he tells them to follow principles, but they would rather say, God will help. God will do it. Just like you mentioned in, um, when you were taking your um, session that we just ended. How best is he going to influence them to change from saying God will do it, but rather for them to begin to I mean, use the principle and work according to those principles? Well, I believe that um, the greatest message that they will hear will be the person's lifestyle. How the person solves problems, deals with issues. Um, ultimately, they will want to find out why he is different. Because Jesus said that the person, the wise man had his sayings, dug deep. You know, the person who built his life on what Jesus said was like the wise man who dug deep, found a rock, and built his house on it. And then he said that there was the other person who had but didn't apply, that he built his house on the sand. See, at the point at which both houses are built, it's difficult to say which one was built on a rock and which one was not. What shows the difference is when the rain comes, when the floods beat, okay, when the floods come. That's when the difference shows. So I would say that what we have to do primarily is, apart from exposing them to the information, telling them what the Word of God says, telling them what the principles are, giving them books to read and encouraging them to read, the other important part of it is we must live the principles. And that's the essence, actually, of our discussion, isn't it? And the essence of this conference, that we must depend on the help of the Holy Spirit to live out those principles do the sowing and reaping, live by the principle of vision. I remember several years ago I heard that one of my old friends said, wow, so those things that Pastor Sam used to talk about, so they're coming to pass, really. He was, talking, he was describing the principle, confession. Words are powerful. They hold creative power. At the time, the period he was describing, I had nothing. I was unemployed. I was done with school, done with my youth service. I didn't have a job. But because of revelations that I had and the knowledge I was getting from the books I was reading, because I was loaning books from my uncle, two books per week to read, and that was changing me inside. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So my words were becoming different from that of people in the environment. I was telling people, I'm not a local champion. I'm going to the world. I was unemployed in the Lorikwara state. I didn't have a bicycle, not to talk of a car or plane. So going to the world was a very distant and very vague idea. And I was bragging. I wasn't suggesting. I was bragging. <laughs> so this person eventually saw the results of what I said. So obvious, I think that's the best way, isn't it, to win someone over. So I will encourage the person, leave the principles. Let the power of the Holy Spirit walk through your life. They will come back to want to listen to you. What you said yesterday that they didn't want to hear, they will come back tomorrow to ask you to say it again because then their hearts will be ready. Thank you so much, sir. I guess the person that wrote this um, is a pastor, and he works with a ministry. And each time... Um, he's been threatened that um, if he should leave that in the ministry, he will run mad. And the guy gives, the, the senior pastor, in quotes, gives example of those that he has done that to. So that guy is stuck. He doesn't know what to do, sir. Wow. We know that such things happen around, isn't it? 
what the leader, what this person's leader is exhibiting is insecurity. Candidly. <laughs> no ministry should crumble because one person left. The one person you should be afraid. It should be the Holy Spirit. The one person you should be afraid should not leave. Should be the Holy Spirit. But other than that, okay, so, but I'll say this. God trains us both through good examples and bad examples of leadership. Your own responsibility is towards God and whatever it is he has asked you to do. One, you need to continue to love your boss. Two, you need to choose who to obey, whether it is God or your boss. You need to choose who to believe. Um, Proverbs 26 two tells me that a curse cannot rest on the person's life without some legal standing, without some reason. Good. Peter and John asked the members of the council whether we should obey God or obey men. You judge. But we cannot but say the things that we saw. So it's up to this person to make a choice. Do you believe what the person has said? Is it God that said it, or the boss, or the pastor? I don't see anywhere in the Bible that will support the fact that I should go mad just because I left your ministry. So as long as I don't believe it, it won't happen to me. So ask God what he wants you to do part time and where he wants you to be. As long as it is God that is asking you to go, because living does not automatically mean you will succeed. It is obeying God's voice. Good. So whatever it is God is asking you to do, your boss can say that and the Holy Spirit will tell you to still stay there because your time for training is not over yet. Hang in. But whenever it is that he tells you to go, go ahead. Obey God. Um, your pastor's voice will never be more effective than God's voice over your life. Amen. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man will do to me. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Just a quick follow-up to the question you just answered. Someone wants to know, yes, he's a subordinate in the ministry. He also knows he has a call of God on his life. He's now asking, how do you know you are supposed to stay in that ministry for life, supporting the man of God? Or you need to move on and kick off the work God has for you. It's in between. He doesn't know at what time which he needs to do. He needs some clarity. Well, I tell people the foundation for ministry is God said. It is when God calls you that you hear and respond. <laughs> if he has not called you and you hear, <laughs> you know what Jesus said in John 10? It must be the voice of a stranger. So ultimately, this question you are asking, nobody can answer it except God. Nobody can call you into ministry. It is God that does. So whether you should stay, or you should move, depends on what God planned for your life. I am assuming that you are in that ministry in the first place because God told you to go there. So until you hear the next instruction, continue to obey the last one. <laughs> so simply, until you've heard from God, just remain put. <laughs> All right? Um, someone is asking, how come when people, Christian, when they go into politics, they change so sudden? The person actually put an example, I wouldn't mention, that the person used to be a fine writer and all of a sudden is in politics now and they are wondering that what is happening, sir? What is the solution? How do we attend to this matter? Hmm. While it is true that God can use circumstances to shape our character, most of the time circumstances also reveal our character. (laughs) 
So the assumption that it is politics that changed them most times is not true. It revealed who they are, who they had been all the while. Uh, that's why when people talk about maybe Christians who have gone into politics or into government who compromise their values, uh, I say, no, I think we who are leaders in church should take responsibility. Because the question we should ask ourselves is, did we prepare them? I think that the proof, one of the signs that a pastor's job or a church's job has been well done is in the capacity of church members to stand during trial. Anybody can be a Christian when things are fine. And if it is this bread and butter teachings, you know, if it's everything is going to be good, perfect teaching that we teach, if that's the only diet that will give people, listen, that's the reality. You are blessed in Christ. When you are in Christ, you are blessed. However, like, um, is it 1 Timothy 3 verse 12 that says that uh, everyone that will live godly in this world will suffer persecution? That it is given unto you on the behalf of Christ to suffer persecution in this world. So uh, there is that part that we don't teach people. And when Jesus recruited people, he didn't make it easy for people. Say, so anyone who wants to follow me, let him deny himself and carry his cross. We're going to die. The, <laughs> listen, the willingness to die for the cause you believe in is what kills the fear of death. So, and Jesus said, I need fearless people to carry out this assignment with me. If we don't bring that dimension in, we can never realize our potentials as Christians. You remember what he said in John 12, 24, except a corn of wood falls to the ground and dies, it remains the way it is. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. So, uh, if we've not prepared people and they find themselves in tough situations, their lack of preparation will show up. Their spiritual immaturity will show up. So, these days, knowing what people are going to meet outside, in the business world, in politics, wherever, it should influence how we prepare people. They should be well cooked. Like I usually say, the first Adam was created in an adult body. But if you met him three days after he was created, he looked like an adult, but he was three days old. When Satan came, he fell flat. So the last Adam, when he came, God allowed him to come as a baby. It took 30 years to cook him. At the river Jordan, opened the heavens, put the power of the Holy Ghost on him. And if you read your Bible very well in Matthew 4, the Bible says he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. God presented Jesus to Satan. Test him. But then Hebrews 5, 8 says that though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. So uh, the people who should go into public office should be people that God has tested on small assignments and whose character has, has been left standing. Amen? Now, these days, politicians in our country confuse us a little bit. One of the easiest things you can do these days to win vote is to claim you're a Christian. So, and then people come around and say, ah, he's a Christian, he's a Christian, he's one of us. I say, mm, hold it. <laughs> who was his pastor? Or who was our pastor? Who was our mentor? I want to know the kind of teachings that the person sat under then I can have a fair assessment of the person's values and principles. Other than that, don't confuse me. Thank you so much, sir. Um, I have one person that I wrote that um, he's been following, exercising the principle, and he expects a positive result, but he's not getting it. He feels what could be responsible for the kind of result he's seen is is I think he's disturbed. I know. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> I've been there. You know, um, 
when our church was young, much younger than this, I, we were doing everything we needed to do. All the things I had written in church growth books, the church was not growing. Or, and I put that in quotes. didn't seem to be growing. So one day I approached Bishop Oedepo. I said, sir, what do you do when you've done everything you should do to make the church to grow, but the church is not growing? He said, son, growth is seasonal. So that's why they wrote in the Bible, let us not be weary in (laughs) well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. He said, growth is seasonal. He said, for as long as the farmer continues to sow, he doesn't have a problem. It's because one day the season will change and his harvest will come. He said, but if out of frustration he stops sowing, he said, that's when there's a real problem. Because when the season for growth and harvest comes, he said, God will have nothing to multiply into his life. He said, so whatever it is you have been doing, continue to do it. What, does, what do principles teach us? They pre- teach us to value process. That it takes time. Amen. Yeah. Uh, a pastor protege like that, God bless him. Wonderful young man. Many years ago came to me and said, sir, Where is the faith that we are teaching? Where is he? And I understand it was an emotional moment for him. His dad was sick and in the hospital. He didn't even have money to pay the hospital bills. He said, and I'm teaching people faith. I can't, I don't even have money to take care of my father. He said, my wife is there. We've been married two years now. She can't conceive to have a baby. He said, sir. And tears were there in his eyes. He said, where is the faith that we are teaching? I said, son, if it is the one that we are teaching from the Bible. <laughs> I said, it is still alive and well. I said, so you have been married for two years. You don't have a baby yet. I said, did you read how many years it took Abraham before he got a baby? <laughs> I said, so, <laughs> better go and sit down. Continue to do what you are doing. God will do whatever he wants to do. But actually, it shocked him. <laughs> He had forgotten that for Abraham it was 25 years. <laughs> the next time we saw, he was smiling. He said, thank God, sir. She has taken it. <laughs> so I will say one thing. The principles of God never fail. It is God that backs them up and he never fails. If the principles ever fail, it won't be from God's end, it will be from man's end. What I will advise you to do also is that principles need adaptation. You read a book written by someone in America. You want to apply the same principle in Nigeria. (laughs) Nigeria is not America. (laughs) The application of principles needs to take into consideration the context. That means that sometimes when in the application of a principle, you need to experiment. If you try this approach, it's not working. You need to change the approach a little bit and try again. Principles need persistence. Persistence itself is a principle. I will stop there. <laughs> Let's give Pastor a big round of applause. And um, I'm going to take just one question, and that is the last question. Um, this person is confused. He knows everybody just has 24 hours. And he's seen so much. You are bringing forth. You are bringing out in 24 hours. Is now asking, how do you manage your time? How, what time do you pray? What time do you study? You are on telly, they will do the broadcast, they will do the recording. You, 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 you still add, you know, some additional qualification from time to time. How do you handle the whole of this? Thank you. Um, time itself is one of the time is one of the those things that God created that he invested phenomenal wisdom into so what I will encourage is first you read through your Bible maybe get a concordance and read all the verses in which you find the word time find out what God says about it okay There are basic principles that govern the management and the use of time. 
But I said you should go through the Bible first so that you can experience paradigm shifts when you get revelations about time and its essence. If, for example, if you are 40 years old, subtract time from your life, what will be left? Nothing. Time is your life. (laughs) Once time ceases to exist in your life, your life has ceased. So time is life. Time is one of the most powerful resources that God gave man. God gave every human being the same amount of time. That's what I love about it. Secondly, I love the fact that time is a convertible resource. Because the strange thing about time is that it cannot be conserved. Unlike money, you can't save it. You can't say, okay, I have 24 hours today, but all the things I want to do will take only three hours. I want to save the remaining 24, 21 hours in the bank. You can't save it. You can't conserve it. Once it's gone, it's gone. Gone forever. Once this day is gone, there will never be another 6th of November 2014 again, ever. (laughs) So what are you supposed to do? Before it goes, convert it. And you convert it through goals. So it is the things you do within the context of time that determine the value that time delivers to you. So you must have goals. You must have dreams, have visions, have plans, strategies. But then when you look at it, time is limited, isn't it? And there are so many things you want to do. You must learn to prioritize. That is it. You will never have enough time for all the things you want to accomplish prioritize. But you will have enough time for the things that matter the most to you. Prioritize. And I found a good tool for prioritizing in Stephen R. Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Because he said they are do first things first. He has a quadrant there. Uh, And he matches importance against urgency. And he says some things are very are important and urgent. He says do them first because they're important and urgent. He says some things are important but not urgent. He advises you should spend more of your time doing those things because it is when you don't do the things that are important but not urgent that they eventually become urgent. And he said by the time they get there most times you have a crisis situation. You are managing crisis. It says some things are not important, but urgent. You need to pay serious attention to them. They are not important, but they have a way of demanding for your attention. Like something is going to fall. Something is going to die. And candidly, nothing will die. And then you have the things that are not important and not urgent. Also in prioritizing, define your roles as a person. Because I tell people I do not recognize success if it doesn't come with a balance. There's no point being the greatest minister in the world when your home is broken. There's no point being the wealthiest person in the world when your health is finished. True success comes with a balance. So Luke 2.52, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature. Wisdom there is mental development. Stature is physical development. He was in favor with God and with men. Favor with God is spiritual development. Favor with men is social development, relationships, family. So don't pride yourself in how long your to-do list is. Ah, I have 50 things to do today. There may be 50 useless things. (laughs) Secondly, you may start with the things that don't really matter and you only got to 15 before the day finished. You didn't touch on important things. But if you ensure that your goals touch on each of the 
roles that you play and those important areas of your life. Like, I'm conscious of the fact that to the public, I'm pastor of senior, uh, I'm senior pastor of Daystar, I'm president of Success Power, fine, and I get public acclaim for that. But I'm somebody's husband. I'm some people's father. I'm a son to some people. I'm a brother to some people. You know, I'm an uncle to some people. Those roles, and I have to define. I tell our associates here, almost everything that I do in this church, you guys can do. So wisdom tells me that whatever I'm doing that somebody else can do, I should delegate it. I should only focus on the things that only I can do. So I tell them, you can't help me to be husband to my wife. (laughs) I'll stop there. (laughs) And you can't help him to be father of his children. So let's stand up, let's give him, give him, give it, give it up, give it up, give it up. Let's just go ahead and appreciate. Sir, thank you so much. All right. Can we pray? Is that okay? Thank you, Lord. Grace is real. God's help is real. I have enjoyed it. I believe it is tangible, it is real. I believe that this conference is a place of grace. A place where God's help becomes real in the life of everyone who desires God's help. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you for the things we have said and the ones we have not said but which will be helpful to someone. I ask that as each one goes, the power of the Holy Spirit will rest on each one. In a new way. Fresh baptisms of power. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Whatever has become stale is renewed. In the name of Jesus. No one pours new wine into old wineskins because it will burst. Heavenly Father, old wineskins can be renewed. They can be washed. They can be treated as they used to do in the days of old. I ask, Father, that by the working of the Holy Spirit, you will touch our hearts. Touch our minds. Touch our emotions. Give us capacity beyond our old abilities. Lord, touch someone's mind with the spirit of understanding, capacity for comprehension. Enlarge somebody's heart with capacity for vision. In the name of Jesus, what you prepared from the foundations of the world that someone has not been able to capture before this conference is over. Heavenly Father, drop it in somebody's spirit. Drop visions of the next level of increase and favor and leadership in the mighty name of Jesus. Above all, Heavenly Father, Jesus said the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. I ask that in the life of everyone present and in our ministries, our places of assignment, Let there be explosions of testimonies. Testimonies of healing. You said we will cast out devils. Wherever we show up, let demonic activities be paralyzed. So, Heavenly Father, with one heart, we join to speak to the prince of the devil over this nation and over the cities that we represent. We cast you down, Satan. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. And I give you authority to tread over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. So Lord, we prophesy on each one's behalf victory. Supernatural victory. Authority to displace territorial spirits and to take over territories from Satan. We take over families. 
organizations, cities, nations, in the mighty name of Jesus. And we prophesy over Nigeria. Satan, your power is broken over this nation. And for the people that God has prepared to influence this nation, we receive the creation of new opportunities. Open doors. The day David was anointed, Saul's seat was declared vacant in the realm of the spirit. As this conference goes on, we declare positions of leadership over this nation and different nations, we declare them vacant. In the name of Jesus. And I prophesy over everyone present here, a season of promotion has come. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.